Hi, I'm Cookie. And I'm Barry. And we're from Old Street Solutions. We build apps that make Jira and Confluence easier to use for all teams. Welcome to Boss Levels, a series to evaluate leaders from the present day, from history and leaders from popular fiction. We'll rate them on their success and their agility. Working in the Agile project management space, we have reporting tools with Jira that help team evaluate the success of their work every day. So this is an extremely useful exercise and an excuse to be nerdy, talking about some of our favorite heroes. And villains. Mm. Right, today I've got an interesting character for you, Barry. This will be fun. Uh, Timogen Chingus Han. Um, Otherwise yes. Known as. Yeah, I, I've never heard that version of his name. Yeah, well, you know, that was his, uh, when he was getting started before he became okay. the legendary Genghis Khan. Mispronounced by historians throughout the West. <laughs> but yeah, if you go to Mongolia, they still call him Chingus Han. So I, I guess that's probably the correct okay. pronunciation. Okay. But uh, yes, yeah, w w wish me luck today. I'm going to defend uh, a genocider as a good leader. <laughs> yes, full full disclosure. I, I knew barely anything about Genghis Khan before Chris suggested doing this boss levels. So he was actually the inspiration for the series for me because I, I, I learned a bunch of very interesting things about how he managed such a large, diverse army across such a massive empire. So let, let's just smack straight into it. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, like in my research uh, and in yours, like just why is he such a legend? <laughs> well, I obviously spent most of my time trying to, I mean, the thing is I can see, uh, I can see the good things he did um but i tried to focus on all the, the the bad stuff and yeah he was pretty darn bad um you, you gotta crack some eggs to, to make some omelets and genghis khan made 16 million omelets or otherwise known as direct descendants um yeah he changed the world he uh i mean you you are like, like the, the whole reason we're doing this this boss levels on genghis khan is because you are clearly a big fan so yeah, I, I think he's amazing, right? And, and I mean, why why you're such a big fan of him? Um, I mean, he conquered pretty much all of continental Asia, right? He didn't get India or Vietnam, but like like he just took over the largest landmass ever. I think the size of his empire he did in twenty years what it took the Roman Empire four hundred years to do. Um, he breaks the rules for every civilization. So whenever you learn about a civilization, right, it's all all about building these cities and the agricultural technology. And they just did none of that, right? They were warring factions that were good at hunting on with a bow and arrow. Uh, mm. And he just unified all these warring tribes uh, and just got bigger and bigger with, with incredible strategy, tactics, leadership. Um, and despite the genociding, which was significant. No, but... <laughs> I'm going to deny that. Um, just incredible. And I, I think it's worth saying, actually, that often the heroes we have historically, um, all the more you look into it, the, the shadier it looks, right? And so people look towards Caesar and all of his military conquests, uh, Alexander the Great. Um, yeah. And, and, and yeah, we just have this tendency in the West that when we look at one of these strange foreign exotic leaders uh to, to to describe it in more honest terms um but yeah i think comparatively with the romans or the greeks you know he killed a lot but my god he built a great empire in a, in a very short space of time so i think for that reason alone it's worth discussing that that said um didn't the empire collapse not long after his his death yes so, so i mean it, it's tough um, you know, we're talking historically and in terms of legacy. Yeah, if, if you yeah, that's the important thing. in terms of his direct descendants, it petered out fairly uh, quickly. But the ripples he made on the world, right? So arguably the formation of China, the formation of Korea, the formation of Russia, um, it, it, these great civilizations were partly due to Genghis Khan unifying large groups of people in the way he did. And the other phenomenal thing he did was 
establish uh, the, re-establish the Silk Road. Okay, so it, it had fallen into disarray. It was very dangerous. Um, but but at the height of uh, the Khan's power, it was said it was possible to carry uh, a tablet of bronze from uh, Shanghai all the, all the way to, to Iran. Uh, and no one would rob you on the way because they just had this phenomenal road, uh, a phenomenal security system and laws. So it actually is arguably the foundation of international trading law is mm. Genghis Khan's empire. So, so, so the effect he had, and then you can see how wealthy uh, China and Europe got once this trading network was set up, uh, just, just really affected the centuries that would follow. So, so yes, although his era was short-lived in historical terms, uh, the, the things he instituted, one of which was uh, religious tolerance mm. um, and more rights for women, um, yeah, did did survive. Um, and yeah, so he certainly had some progressive ideas. Um, yeah, so the treatment of women, uh, he was very open to lots of different religions. Didn't seem to. Line he just wasn't well. bothered, right? He was just a very practical man. So, so um, I, I think, yeah, the, the Mongolians had their own religion, sort of, we'd, we'd recognize it as similar to paganism, sort of worshipping nature, sort of thing. Mm -hmm. um, and, but for him, like, he didn't really mind any differences on that front. Um, mm -hmm. He he was quite good at uh, just using people and moving them throughout the empire where they were needed. So I guess he was uh, the first person to be hiring multinational consultants, right? Yeah. So so he'd, he'd find these brilliant architects and engineers, and obviously they were hunters, right? Like they didn't have any of that technology, but he respected it. So he'd like, I, th I think the first time the Mongols sieged a castle would have been the the first castle they'd seen. <laughs> like mm -hmm. This was new to them. And so as soon as they seize one, they'd like capture all the smart people involved and be like, right, how was this built? Are there any secret back passages? How do other civilizations capture castles? And so he, he learned siege warfare in a matter of years because every battle he'd won, he'd capture the smartest people, interrogate them. And yeah often anyone that didn't comply to him he, he would have brutally killed but uh, you know th those that saw the options <laughs> death or, or a job um, many took the job yeah. and, and then he would absorb that knowledge into his empire and, and use it and, and that's obviously um connected with because he instituted uh, meritocracy which again is another very progressive uh, movement. He was clearly seeking out people so who would have from day one, right? Even, even the Mongols, uh, although they probably more egalitarian than a lot of societies. I think historically there's a pattern where the rougher things are, and the more <laughs> egalitarian things are often because you need to work together to survive, right? Mm -hmm. um, but but still, there was a lot of nepotism, right? And if you were the chieftain, it was expected that the person that your successor would be your son mm -hmm. right yeah. um and and although we had a bit of that he didn't have a lot of time for it um and and his main thing was just seeing the value in people and and although mm -hmm. he was known as being brutal you have to remember that history is written by the educated and the wealthy and so part of the most terrifying thing about genghis khan is he would show up he'd kill all the people in charge and then all the peasants below right who aren't the people writing history he'd say there's now spaces available. Who, <laughs> who is looking to be middle management? We've got some new vacancies. Um, and so he really would, yeah, cl clear out the old system, kill the people at the top, and then and then offer any, anyone that's got a bit of nous about them, got some ideas. Like, like yeah, we we are hiring. <laughs> so, which makes him very modern as a as a leader, really. I mean, well, um, if you were going to compare him to, to a modern leader, I think you'd have to. But in that sense, in point that out sense. the millions he killed. So I, I, I will concede there that he was a naughty boy. Um, <laughs> a naughty boy. If it wasn't so many hundred years ago, I, I don't think I'd be allowed to get away with enthusiastically vouching. But the thing is, you, you made the the point earlier that um, he wasn't massively different to other great leaders of the time, Alexander the Great. 
for example, what why is he considered a great and not a barbarian like Genghis Khan is considered? Do you know the definition of the word barbarian, by the way? No, I don't. The well, Romans just called barbarian anyone that wasn't a Roman. So, so you can kind of see this like historical uh, Western supreme narrative that's going on here. Um, but yeah, yeah, like I say, I think the most fascinating thing for me is, yes, he killed a lot. Um, but especially when he was getting started, his sons were worse. But especially at, at the start of his conquering the whole of Asia, he was most famous for actually killing relatively few. So he would often, um, like pirates in the later years, lead by his reputation, right? So he had this horrific reputation. He'd burnt cities to the ground. So when he showed up, he'd be like, look, we're just driving through. Um, if you give us some money, we'll leave your town alone. And uh, more and more towns would do that. And so he'd actually avoid battle often just, just by getting paid to, to not fight them. Um mm -hmm. But but yeah, as I say, I, I don't underestimate the the fact that he would often kill the people in charge, and and you've got to think who's writing history, and the letters that would be being sent towards neighbouring uh, cities and towns. Um, yeah, you can see why he was so feared, and I think you know often these famous conquerors kill hundreds of thousands of soldiers, right? Uh, very often, like the pirates, he would he would be in a situation where he'd show up to a town, and people had a horrible leader they weren't particularly loyal to, and they were then faced with like surrendering or fighting for the leader they didn't like. And if they surrendered quickly, they would get their horrible leaders deposed, and then get the offer of joining a very successful and growing business enterprise. Yeah, <laughs> the original it, it... hostile takeover in corporate terms. He did supposedly, yeah, everybody he conquered, he did give them the chance to surrender. Is that right? Before. Yes, but he was pretty brutal to those <laughs> that refused. Again, get a reputation to uphold. So, so hmm. yeah, he, he would offer peace and quarters uh, for those unfortunate enough to uh, try and uh, deny him. Uh, yeah, he would kill every single person and burn them to the ground. And I think... Again, if you count his sons, you're looking at 10 million killed, are the estimates? If, by his sons? Uh, him and his sons, yeah. Oh, God, 40 million killed. Uh, no, it's more than that. <laughs> Which, if you look yeah. at terms of the total population of the Earth at the time, I think mm -hmm. you're looking at a significant percentage. Apparently it was enough to uh, <laughs> cool the Earth. So he was an environmentalist. Y yeah. I mean, from what I was reading, it's it, the estimates are between 40 and 100 million. Wow. Um, that was 11% of the entire world population. You know, uh, omelettes, few eggs. <laughs> <laughs> pretty, pretty brutal, pretty brutal. Uh, yeah. I heard, yeah, he, um, he wiped out two thirds of northern China. Um, and, and yeah, there are cities that... Uh, yeah, so, uh, famously yeah, so, big so, that never recovered and, and, and like are only taught. But, but, but China is one of the examples you gave of, of uh, a system he put in place in a country that's thrived as a result of him. Um, kind of, yeah. I'm not qualified really to speak mm -hmm. to uh, Chinese history too much, but uh, it's, it's my understanding that the uh, ruling dynasty that came after Genghis Khan um, was sort of formed from the descendants of Khan. Uh, I think there were five Khanates, right? W mm -hmm. One of which was, yeah, a, a combination of Chinese and Mongol um, leadership. So like, you know, the Brits are part Viking invasions, part Roman invasions, yes. right? Like, like that's, it's definitely a part of the Chinese history. I mean, shall we talk a little bit more about like, how many people killed and like all the all the bad stuff? <laughs> um, yeah, fair enough. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, so forty to a hundred million dead uh, as a result of his conquests. Um, he waged a campaign against Western Shia. Um, this was the final military action led by Genghis Khan, and he died during it. Uh, Is this the but, area now known as Iran? Uh, that uh, that's 
separate, I think. Okay. Um, but he, according to one historian I was reading about, um, the the policy was total obliteration, and as a result, no, no, it's it's nothing to do with Iran because oh, um, it's not Shia it's, Muslim, it's Shia, Shia with an X. Shia, Shia, I might pronounce yeah, it wrong, sure, sure, sure. but Western Shia is is little known to anybody apart from experts now because there's uh, it was a whole society and there's nothing left of it as a result. Again, yeah, can't. It's arguably um, one of the first genocides, right? Yeah, well, um, the, John Mann is the is the historian I was reading about. He said it's the first ever recorded example of attempted genocide. Um, Brutal. So, <clears throat> also, um, his invasions are considered the beginning of a two hundred year period known in Iran and other Islamic Islamic countries as the Mongol catastrophe. Um, yeah, and. Yeah. The conquests are second only to World War Two in terms so, of death toll. There's um there's a great YouTuber called Kraut who does a series uh, historically, and one of the things he looks at is Russia and how Russia mm-hmm. today can very clearly be understood to have never recovered from this period, right? Like what what they did, that just mm-hmm. wiping out the country and then only having a few warlords who would pay tax to their feudal masters. Is mm-hmm. the system that's mostly remained in place until this day. Yeah. So, so yeah, he really has had a, a horrific. Uh, <laughs> well, it, 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 Iran. Um, he he did also conquer Iran, and three quarters of the population there uh, were killed. And apparently, the population didn't reach pre-Mongol levels until the middle of the last century. Wow, um, and and of course th- this was all happening in the twelve hundreds, so that's that's a long time for the the population to recover. Um, yeah, ten to fifteen million people uh, killed in Iran. Um, there's also the the massacre of Yurjench that was in twelve twenty one. That's known as one of the bloodiest massacres in human history. The city was annihilated. Um, One uh, Persian scholar says that uh, 50,000 Mongol soldiers were given the task of executing 24 Yurjent citizens each. Uh, That would mean that 1.2 million people were killed. Uh, Some historians say that this is a bit logistically impossible, Uh, but clearly a lot of people were killed. Uh, well when you put it like that he doesn't sound so good (laughs) but (laughs) i mean you know it's an impressive tally (laughs) (laughs) what killing so many people (laughs) killing so many people so quickly yeah i mean yeah obviously that's hard to defend It, it, it is uh brutal and terrible um but you know that's, but he, but, that's what I mean, he set out to do, right? He was in the business of taking over the world, and my God, yeah. did he get results? But what I, uh, what confuses me is is the way he's remembered. Uh, like he is remembered by quite a lot of people as a good leader, but he murdered that many people to establish his empire. I mean, is does surely that he's not a good leader as a result? Um, well, let me put this question to you. Uh, is there any military hero that conquered a large empire without killing a lot of people? At that time, probably not. Uh, the thing with him, though, it's the scale of... I mean, he he, he did succeed in building the largest ever empire, but... Yeah, no, I mean, let, let, let's be clear. Scale of I, I, I have so bigger than all of these other leaders. I have no ambitions for genocide, and so it's obviously deplorable and terrible. Um, but in terms of what he wanted to achieve, achieving it, uh, nailed yeah. the, like, like nailed the mission. Um, so I wonder why, like, because obviously, like Hitler is is not remembered as um, as a great leader. Is it literally because? It, well, some people do argue that he was he was a great leader in some senses. He just didn't have the success um, that that Genghis Khan had. 
but he was still a good strategist. I mean, I think this the big one's time, right? Like that, there, there are living relatives who can still discuss the history of, of the atrocities of the Second World War. We have video documentation. It's still part of our lived trauma, right? Um, mm. And, you know, I'm sure there are uh, yeah, people in Iran, China, who still think of Genghis Khan not fondly at all, but as this terrible, terrifying, almost mythological monster, right? Um so, so, so yes, I, I don't want to b- belittle any of that. Although, as I say, I do think the hundreds of years g- gives it a, a bit less of a, a smack than more recent atrocities. Um, mm. But, but yeah, in terms of just how impressive he was, as I said, like I don't, I, I don't think you're wrong. I, th- I, I think he is a monster. Um, but at the same point, yeah. Like, let, let's remember that when we're talking about Alexander the Great or Julius Caesar well, of Rome. Yeah. Most of these empires are built on the blood and bones he, of their enemies. He was a monster, but he does need to be put into the context of the time. Um, like with so many things. Um, yeah. Yes. As you say, the, uh, many other leaders were, were just as bad, uh, if not worse. And actually... Genghis Khan did have some progressive views and a, a different way of doing things. Religious tolerance. Um, um, yeah. Also uh, entirely uh, much more supportive of women. Um, there was a common practice uh, about uh, people stealing wives from neighboring villages. He put an end mm-hmm. to that, outlawed that. Um, he actually, uh, one of the earliest leaders to give women the right to divorce their husbands if they were unhappy. Mm-hmm. Um, but also, allowing, women were given roles and jobs in the, uh, yeah. in the empire, and, and allowing people to prove themselves, prove their talent and their military skills, and and, and letting them rise to to power rather than them just being born into the the roles. Yeah, that was also yeah. um, quite different to what other leaders were doing at the time. Yeah, and I think that's part of the, the flip side of the number of people killed is how effective an army he set up. So I think at its height, his army was only 130,000, like relatively small for the numbers mm-hmm. of people he's killing. Um, but but he just, so many people were focused on castles, right, and defense. Um, and I think similar to the Viking barbarians who realized that if you just threw away the armor and the shield and just had two axes and attacked really quickly, <laughs> fearlessly. Yeah very hard to be stopped um and and likewise he came up with the same thing just the speed of lightly armored people on horseback who were damn good at archery so they could attack from a distance um again not not many civilizations had nailed the ability to shoot a bow and arrow accurately on a horse it it was uh pretty terrifying and if you look at some of his uh strategy and tactics how quickly he learned siege warfare Right, so to be like, oh damn, this is a castle. This isn't going to work. How do mm-hmm. we get them? And I think one of the first things he, he was one of the earliest leaders to come up with the the fake retreat, right? The a feint. Right. So yeah, any any time uh, there'd be a standing army foolish enough to stand, he'd he'd look at them, size them up, turn around and run away. And often these armies would chase, right? And mm-hmm. then it turned out that round the corner, over the hill, massive number of troops waiting, and, and it all been a, a big trap. So, so I think he was sort of very good at thinking on his feet, um, and, and like I say, realizing when there was a technology that he wasn't ready for, capturing um, the intelligent people, the king's advisors, right, interrogating them, giving them jobs, advising his generals how to. And then another thing he did, which I thought was really impressive, um, and I actually first learned about at some Agile conference, was that he had units of 10 men all the way down, right? So um, every group of 10 people would appoint their um, sergeant, right? And every group of 10 sergeants would appoint their captain, and every group of 10 captains would appoint their uh, general, and and, okay. and and so uh, Khan's council he'd be talking to 10 men and then those 10 men would talk to their 10 men all the way down so he was getting information from the bottom up and he was able to 
deliver orders uh, from the top down with this very efficient thing of just, you know, Jeff Bezos is a, a team of two pizzas, right? <laughs> like keep the yeah. group small enough that everyone can have input, that communication will be good. And, and copy that all the way down when that communication was, yeah, remarkably efficient. And the other thing he set up, which I thought was amazing, was this uh, system of communication. So he had relay stations throughout his empire, uh, mm -hmm. the, these ponies, right? They, they were the distance apart that a pony could gallop in one go, right? Mm -hmm. And so news traveled fast. And so he was able to quickly learn, this is how why if someone committed a crime, they would be brought to justice swiftly because, yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. You you had yeah, I, regular stations and communication, and so so I I think there are things that he did were just remarkably savvy and and, and clever, um, combined with the meritocracy and, and and agile, yeah, and, and combined with the ability to adopt uh, and tolerate differences, um, mm -hmm. is a reason why his empire grew so big. I think if he tried to make everyone Mongolian or tried to put Mongolians in charge of everyone, he would have had a really bad time. Yeah, yeah. Okay, so how would you rate him? Um, <laughs> I feel bad being so positive about a genocide, though, but as I say, everyone in history is terrible, and you've got to judge judge him on sort of what he tried and to the, do. Yeah, and the thing is, he wouldn't have, well, he would have been by some people, but by a lot of people, he wasn't regarded as terrible at the time because he wasn't like outside the realms of what other well, well straight up if he if he was a, a caesar in rome uh, he would mm -hmm. be remembered as the best right like, like i'll put it that way like he, yeah he, he would have eclipsed julius caesar easily with the, with the speed with which he conquered an empire so so in terms of how we worship western military leaders mm -hmm. he, he scores very highly so uh, apologies to the descendants of uh, anyone that uh, w was hurt by the Khan. But uh, <laughs> yeah, I think in terms of agility um, for his time, incredibly impressive, I think. Now, this is tough because ironically, you know, his downfall was, I, as far as I can tell, giving positions to his sons, something he didn't do the entirety of his reign and then at the end, right? Gave to his sons and his sons were much more brutal and much less tolerant and so sort of it quickly fell apart as everyone united against them right yeah but if you judge the man on his era right we, i'm not going to judge george lucas by how well his son makes movies <laughs> I, I think in terms of agility nine out of ten yeah i would probably agree with that from everything i've read Oh, oh, one thing he did, uh, he he was blamed for the Black Death. Have you heard this? Uh, I have heard this, but I've heard that it, there's not any real evidence to support that. Yeah, yeah. so a lot of it, and again, this is reputation, right? But uh, there are stories where he um, captured trebuchets, catapults, and slung corpse infected bodies over the walls to try and infect oh, castles no, no. under sea. I have heard that. Yeah, and I'm not sure that's true, but I think apparently by setting up the Silk Road and all the travel from east to west, he did he was a significant cause or at least catalyst of uh, the start of the Black Death. Um couldn't get away without <laughs> telling that story. That. <laughs> Terms of leadership, um I, again, I, I think he loses points for giving it all to his sons at the end. I, I think that's got to gotta be judged. He he did so well, but but to give it all away. Uh, however, I mean, God, how many direct descendants are there of Genghis Khan in the end? Millions and millions. Uh, I, I recently <laughs> found out I'm part Mongolian. So <laughs> did you? Yeah, uh, did one of those genetic tests. So uh, <laughs> yeah, he's had a. A legacy on the world uh but i think yeah just god judge him a bit he loses points for giving the empire to his sons at the end i think that was a squandered opportunity mm -hmm. i'll give him yeah eight, and out so of, eight out of ten for leadership for leadership okay and strategy um some some brilliant things some of it apocryphal i think he was great to not pick a fight um if you're going to 
conquer such a large empire offering deals right like the ability to be paid off pick choose your battles um mm -hmm. i think he did very well from i'm not going to score him on creativity because i think it's not it's not fair to compare him with george lucas on that front uh so i think everyone will score on agility and leadership and each leader we should score on a, a third factor that's kind of within their industry right um i think his strategy was good but ultimately it, it's hard to say right was he too brutal yes was that ultimately yeah, that's what that was that's what i would argue like it right? was actually good to to establish to to be to establish the powerful empire that he did he had to it worked murder it that lived. many people right have you heard the machiavellian saying is it better to be loved or feared uh yeah, yeah. and, and yeah. machiavelli recommends feared if you have to choose because um you know love yeah. love can fade but fear remains but i i think this actually shows the limits of fear mm. as well like like as soon as people sense cracks in this empire the whole thing collapses it, it worked as long as it was absolute right yeah. um and and so as a short-term strategy brilliant but in the end it, it was the entire empire's downfall so i'll mm. give him a five yeah five for that he scores highly uh but he definitely loses points for committing genocide of millions of people <laughs> could have scored higher gengus any other final thoughts barry do you think i was far too positive about an evil mass I, I think you i think you were fair um yeah if, if not to the descendants of those killed um, no the we're acknowledging like that he slaughtered a lot of people but he also had some interesting ideas and a different way of doing things um and he did establish a massive empire didn't last but um and yeah and he, he, he brought in outsiders with different perspectives to to mix yeah. things up and, and and share the learning i think that's a key takeaway here don't genocide, other, but, yeah. but copy that those bits are the good bits yeah and there are plenty of other similar stories where previously warring disparate tribes have been united by a, a new leader and it has brought peace it's brought progress um the the way these things are done is is what causes us to question it centuries on mm. um but we can't deny the progress that was made after all the blood was spilled <laughs> so not condoning genocide <laughs> <laughs> we'll end it there barry who are we talking about next week so we, we're talking about a fictional leader next oh nice <laughs> We're going to talk about Daenerys Targaryen from Game of Thrones, who, as it happens, shares quite a lot of similarities with Genghis Khan. So it makes quite a lot of sense that we uh, follow up the Khan with, with her. Fair enough. I look forward to it. Thank you very much for your time, Barry. Cool.